All right, thanks Naomi and Peter for inviting me. And, and um, I, as you, these are all slides are actually on SlideShare, uh, and I tweeted it this morning. And if you look at the other stuff on SlideShare, you realize that at least since I joined the NIH, I used to say I'd never give the same talk twice when I was doing research. Now I only give one talk many times. Um, I just changed the title on a couple of other things and, and pretend it's something new. Um, I'm also embarrassed to say that when I gave a keynote here, I don't know, four years ago, I had, I had to declare that I hadn't written a line of code in probably 10 years. Well, now it's like 14 years, so what on earth I'm doing here, I don't know. But um, I certainly appreciate all the work you do. I'm really uh, supportive of what you're trying to do and what you are doing. So I'm really going to describe some of the things that uh, I'm now in a position to, I hope, catalyze. and some of the ways that at least we're thinking about catalyzing them and I really want your feedback um, because there's a, there's a big opportunity here. You'll see there's also some challenges but there are big opportunities and we need to do this together. So, uh, and so I would encourage you not to wait necessarily to questions. If you have, if something I say really, I should say, pisses you off uh, or you really like, don't hesitate to put your hand up and let's have a discussion about it in between times. So I, I, you know, that would be, to me, have an interactive kind of uh, session would be much better than just hearing me drone on for a period of time. Okay, so um, I'm giving you effectively a view from the funding agencies and I should say that uh, I actually report to, directly to Francis Collins, who's the director of the NIH, in what we're trying to do. And he tweeted this picture when you have to, it's, it's very formal, you have to be sworn in and all this kind of stuff. And when he tweeted this picture, I got a, an email from an old friend from Columbia I hadn't seen for 20 years who said, I recognize the tie and shirt, but the jacket looks new. Um, <laughs> so it's a great pleasure to be here and not wearing a tie, I have to tell you. Um, okay, enough of that. So, you know, I think we are in this both challenging time and cha time of opportunity. Charles Dickens in Tale of Two Cities says it's very well, so I won't repeat it again here, but so I think it, it means that we need to figure out ways to do better than we're doing, but at the same time, because of the way our science is going and the perception of the way we do our science, uh, and in fact the way we're actually doing it is changing, I think we have lots of opportunities. But there are a sort of tale of two numbers here. Uh, not cities, but numbers. So on, on the left is one of, you could draw up many different graphs, but this is effectively the NIH budget uh, adjusted for inflation over, you know, over time. The budget is about, sorry, this is a slightly US centric, but I think what I'm saying is pretty much global in its application. Uh, is about $30 billion a year, and adjusted for biomedical inflation, it's actually slightly declining. At the same time, and I only use data here as an example, it's true in, in areas of software as well, and this, the graph on the right is just taken from the NAR database issue and shows the growth. So clearly, you know, a first grader could tell you that this doesn't scale in its current form. And uh, you know, the question is, what do we do about it? So when I was presenting this yesterday, you know, Alex Bateman got up and said, well, maybe it's not quite as bad. So as I said, I already do this one talk many times. I did it in the automated functional prediction SIG yesterday, at least part of it. Um, he stood up and said, well, maybe it's not that bad. It's really how we emphasize where we spend money. And I think that is true, you know. So uh, I don't, but we don't know the answers. You know, I've spent a lot of time going around the biggest biomedical funding body in the world asking the people who are in charge there effectively two questions. Uh, how much are we actually spending on data and software related activities? And the answer is, I don't know. We really don't know, but we're actually beginning to get a handle on, in fact, what that is. And then the even more fundamental question is how much should we be uh, spending to achieve the maximum benefit uh, to biomedical science relative to what we spend in other areas? So there's this sort of emergent tension between the new, you know, lots of new ways of doing uh, biomedical research that revolve around analytics and, and software and data versus effectively the old school of how things are being done. And, you know, I think it's hard to evaluate to maximize productivity and progress what the relative balance of those costs should be. 
my sense is that it can only get better for you folks. I mean, it's just, it's clear to me that, um, you know, that the role that analytics uh, is going to play is, is just going to increase. So therefore, you know, more money is going to be available. My appointment and the, the program that, one of the programs that I'm heading up, uh, it's really a testament to that, and I'll say more about that in a minute in, t in terms of how it relates to what you can do with software. Uh, of course, there are other drivers of change out there apart from economics. Uh, and, you know, so let's look at that briefly. Uh, this is from Carol, who's sitting there, um, in terms of reproducibility. And we're going to cover this this afternoon. So I won't say uh, a lot about it now, except to say, uh, we, hopefully we'll get into this in the panel discussion. But uh, this has become a, a pretty, this is actually a real hot button within the NIH. Until they found smallpox last week, it was probably the biggest button. <laughs> uh, that, that sort of put it on the back burner just for a few days until we, the CDC took that away. But um, you know, this is this is a key issue, and it's quite simple why. Because you know, research, at least in this country, for biomedical research, that that thirty billion dollars that comes as a direct appropriation from the U.S. Congress to twenty-seven institutes and centres. So, for example, the National Cancer Institute gets $4 billion or four plus billion dollars a year directly. So that appropriation is made by people who don't really understand what we do. Um, and so if they happen to read in the newspaper that 47 of 53 landmark publications in cancer research could not be reproduced, they start scratching their head and say, why are we giving these, these folks $4 billion a year? This you know, has serious consequences. So, because they don't really understand the, the issues uh, as, they, as they really are. So, um, and that's not a criticism, it's just, you know, there's only so many hours in a day. So we have to, I think, do a better job at passing that message, uh, you know, what the current situation really is. Um, and we also need to, in, in many ways, cover our ears as to what it is we do. So right now there is a series of efforts going on across these 27 institutes and centres at NIH. Each one of them is looking at reproducibility. They're actually looking at some of their key findings that have come in the last several years and they're in the process of reproducing some of those experiments to sort of get a better handle on things. And I mean, alluded to the paper that we did which was basically saying I can't reproduce work from my own lab. And I, you know, I just, because I was leaving academia, well, that wasn't why I published that, because I published it because the bottom line is it's true for pretty much everybody. And it wasn't that I couldn't reproduce, it was the fact that it took a while to do it. And any new graduate student who comes into the lab knows straight away what, the, what they're faced with, is you have to go scurrying around, finding scripts, finding bits of data, doing this and that. We really, and you know, the irony of it is, you know, it was a long time since I was a graduate student, but the fact of the matter is things have not really changed that much. I mean, certainly a lot of the workflow tools and a lot of the uh, things that we now have, have, of course, helped a lot, but I still think we need to do more. And uh, some of the things that I'm going to describe to you are sort of uh, ways of doing more. On another note, and this is really just background again for the uh, panel this afternoon, is the NIH convened a meeting recently with publishers to try and get publishers committed to doing more uh, to sort of uh, facilitate uh, reproducibility. For example, making sure that the software and the data associated with studies was actually accessible. Some publishers have gone this far already. Plus, which of course I'm intimately associated with, has uh, essentially declared you can't publish a paper unless you make the data, at least the data, available. And I'm not sure where we stand with the software, but well, certainly that's something that needs to be addressed as well. All right. So, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot more that's going on, and I'll say uh, a bit more about that in the panel. So let me leave that uh, aside. No one's interrupted to say anything yet. That's a disappointment. Okay, so... Um, I think there's this sort of growth is another driver. I mean, I'm actually very excited about uh, with the point we are now. I'm not sure I necessarily agree with these folks from MIT, but this is just one instance that sort of they would say we are on this inflection point of change in an exponential changing in, in, uh, environment. Uh, and their arguments are that things like Google Car, Waze, were things that we thought would take much longer than they actually took. 
And the reason they're here today and working well is that we have the ability to ingest in real time and process very large amounts of data and get outcomes uh, in ways that we didn't think would be possible right now. So if this is true, then of course we're at this leading edge of how this applies to biomedical research. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's clear it will. So it's a very exciting time. All right, so you know, we have this unprecedented opportunity, but we're also in a point of upheaval. Now what does that mean from a funder's perspective, which I now am, I guess? Um, I think it's a time to squeeze every penny and cent uh, from uh, you know, what we do. And it's really kind of ironic to be on the other side of the fence. I mean, you know, three months ago I was a, a moaning, groaning PI who was getting his grants turned down. And now suddenly I'm hearing the moans and groans. And I think it would be, and of course I've drunk the, cool, the NIH Kool-Aid, so it's when I, now I wish that uh, there was a way that you could all have a window into what goes on on a daily basis so you could see what these folks try to do to maximize uh, the, the amount of research that you can get done. It is quite truly remarkable. These are people who are dedicated to this cause and they work really hard to make it happen. It starts at the top, you know, there, you know, there's Francis Collins is on Capitol Hill almost every week lobbying for more for the NIH. And then how that money is spent, people really are dedicated to doing the best with it. Anyway, enough of that. Um, so I've been very impressed in the time I've been there. So, but, so I think the way I see this moving forward is a sort of top-down versus bottom-up approaches. And let me sort of illustrate what that means and what it means to you as software developers. First of all, there are a set of rules coming down, have come down, uh, which is sort of the top-down approach to which impacts us all in what we do. So, of course, there's what's called the common rule, FISMA and HIPAA, which speak to what the requirements around patient and clinical data. But there's also the data sharing policies that came out in the US and the equivalents have come out in other parts of the world, including Europe. So the Office of Science and Technology Policy, the president put down a thing that basically said all, all, public, all data that's generated on federal dollars, i.e. taxpayers' dollars, needs to be publicly available. Oh, and by the way, we're not going to give you any more money to do that. <laughs> so it was, as they say, as I've all these terms I learned now, an unfunded mandate. And so that means that, you know, we have to do something. It, it, so the, the positive side is that suddenly all this data is starting to appear. The negative side is, uh, you know, this, the, how do we do it efficiently? And so, you know, this requires a lot of thought. Um, and then, of course, beyond this sort of standard requirements, uh, which, by the way, are actually quite profound. I mean, I think the, the kinds of things that happen, and which I never would have thought about, and something I'll just say because I think we could all learn so much from it. So in the three months I've been there, I've been to the White House twice to have meetings about this. Um, and one of those meetings, which I wasn't at, was that um, I sort of did some preparative work for it, is that, you know, the President of the United States is interested in genomics and big data. He asked for a brief on it. There was a brief given by Francis Collins and Eric Lander. And there will be a follow-up action set of action items around that. So there's, there's lots of opportunities coming here. Right? The other side of it, which I hadn't really thought about, which I would encourage you to think about more yourselves, is that listening to other branches of the federal government talk about what they do with that big data has been very informative. So I would say NOAA, which de deals with the atmosphere and the ocean, um, they've done some very uh, interesting things in terms of new types of business models, new types of uh, data accessibility, which probably in the biomedical sciences we could learn from. So I think having, you know, talking to these kind of people, which frankly I hadn't really done very much until I was in this job, which I should have, so it's my bad, but I would encourage you to, you know, reach out to these kind of people. Wander over into departments in your institution that you don't usually go into and see what they're doing with data. You might get some pleasant surprises. Okay, so within the general rubric of making data accessible, uh, if you go to particular data types like GWAS, or now genome data, the, re the requirements for data sharing are actually even more well specified and this is going to continue to trickle down. 
So in other words, we're going to see you know, requirements for more and better classified or uh, described data than we've had before, which of course uh, provides a lot of opportunities around the software space. Uh, it's all, be all becoming digital, and then I mentioned reproducibility. The bottom up, of course, is what you, you know so well and what you're already doing. And I, you know, so you, around collaboration, open source, all of the standards. So as these two things, you know, what I'm thinking about is how can we spend money to really bring those two together in the most productive and useful ways. And so that's sort of uh, the, the ess um, an essence for me. And considering this audience, um, I think another aspect that, so these are all in some senses things to be dealt with and problems. So another aspect for me is, and I'm very sensitive to this because once upon a time, many years ago in a, long, in a galaxy far, far away, I was actually one of you, uh, one of the people who I think, for many of you, I think are very under, maybe you disagree, and if you do, that's fine, uh, under, under uh, appreciated within your academic institutions. And, um, you know, the impact of that now is becoming quite serious. So, because you, many of you have really good opportunities outside of academia. And of course, this is a big problem for places like the NIH because they're spending money training you uh, either as graduate students or as postdocs, and then what happens is you get on the Google bus. So, the Google, you know, the Google bus is, which, <laughs> I have to say that my own personal instance of this is that in San Diego, where I came from, uh, there is no Google, Google doesn't have an office, but they have an office in Irvine, which is about an hour and a bit away. And every day they have a bus that goes from San Diego to, to Google up in Irvine. Well, half my lab, it could be called the Born Lab bus, because half my lab left the lab and went and started getting on the bus and going up to Google. So, and it's not, I mean, I'm not going to be able to retain a lot of those people. We, the academia is never going to be able to compete financially. But uh, some of those people didn't leave for financial reasons. They left because they were not respected within the academic system. And there's, very, I could, you know, there's various ways that we're trying to address that and with various types of awards, even some we talked about endowments and all sorts of things. Uh, and I could get into that if you're interested. But all I'm saying at this point is don't leave yet. There's, there's hope on the horizon. Um, all right, so, so the time for you is here. Uh, we need new business models if this is going to work. And it's time, we really, to be the most efficient, we have to do the soft, best software practices, which, of course, is what you've been doing all along. So what are we doing about it? You're already doing your bit. Uh, I think, first of all, we've got to think about this in terms of the complete research life cycle. And I've shown this sort of many times before, and you're all familiar with this kind of thing, so I'm not going to belabor this. But, you know, we have a research life cycle. We have all of the bits. So we have ideas, hypotheses, experiments, data, all the way through to how we disseminate. Various tools and things that effectively assist us in, in maintaining all of that. And the problem is, of course, is they don't necessarily connect very well with each other, and they don't really connect very well with the sort of underlying framework. Uh, and then, of course, there are all the other things on the other side, you know, the resources and things, and I've just sort of at some point tried to sort of assess from my own, my own interest what, where we were with each of these. So if, they, if it has a Swiss flag, I feel like at some level we're doing okay with it. Uh, if we're clapping hands, it means we're probably ahead of the game. If it's a skull and crossbones, we probably should be doing better than we are. Um, ha this has no meaning whatsoever. It's just, my, uh, just my, my feelings about things. But, you know, what we need to do is to become, in, in my opinion, uh, is to be interconnected around a common framework in a way that we aren't right now. Um, so what I'm about to tell you is what we're about to, or have embarked on um, and we definitely want your input on, is we are proposing that common framework. And that common framework is simply something we're calling the commons. And I have two folks that are helping me lead this, uh, Vivian Benazi, who's had a lot of experience, and some of you may know if you have worked in the area of genomics, but her knowledge is beyond all of that. And George Comastasis, who's actually now working at NCBI, um, and so the National Library of Medicine is a key part of this as well. 
So what we're about to embark on, first of all, is a public-private partnership, uh, which is fairly unusual for the government, but uh, is clearly something that is you know, really required here, because there's something in this, for I think, for everyone. It's also going to be an agile kind of uh, development. It's not going to be creating this big thing and hoping people are going to come and use it. Uh, the federal government has failed at that many times, trust me. Um, so it's really the idea of having some agile pilots and seeing how they work, evaluating them and moving them on. And there are various pieces to all of this. So one of them is that dbGaP, which some of you may use, um, there was a lot of contestants whether this should go in the cloud. Uh, this is now, it's now been agreed that this will become a cloud resource. So the, the point is this is a, a recognition that uh, clinical data can be put into cloud environments. There was, you know, uh, and in fact, I mean, the truth of it is, in my opinion, again, is in many cases it's probably more secure in, clou in, in cloud environments than it is in some academic medical centers. Uh, and we're going to experiment with some new funding strategies, which uh, I think represent some opportunities for you, so I'm going to tell you about those as well. So let's see, what is this commons thing? Um, well, it's not a database. Uh, it's not confined to one physical location. Uh, it's a, not a new large infrastructure, and it's not owned by any one group. Uh, my analogy is it's basically a conceptual framework. My other analogy is, in many ways, I think about it like the internet itself. Maybe not now, but initially in the earlier stages. So what in the earlier stages of the internet, there was a number of separate networks that used their own protocols, and at some point, they agreed to come together. We'll see how much of this coming together or this kind of thing happens straight away. But in this case, what we're talking about is simple, it's just really a collaboratory where there are two, at the beginning at least, two basic rules. Uh, all components of this system, so all of that, when I showed you that research life cycle, all of the pieces in that life cycle, uh, they become, they are simply research objects in this space. And the only requirement is that they have some form of identifier and they have some form of provenance. That provenance will be quite limited. And so this, of course, applies to software objects as well, which is the most relevant to you. So that's sort of, uh, you know, and what it looks like is the sort of the following. So you can think about it in different ways. Uh, I mean, everyone's going to, it's like the internet, right? If I asked every one of you what the internet is, you'd all probably all tell me something different. But the fact is you use it every day and you, you're pretty happy with it. Um, and, it's, and it's been an amazing engine of innovation. <laughs> So I'm not saying this will go the same way, but at least we, we try and think about it that way. So you can think about it as a collaborative environment. You can think about it as a research sandbox where you can do some things. Uh, and you could even think about it as, because you know, David Lippmann and I have been plotting this, uh, you could think about it almost as an extramural uh, NCBI. So it's sort of some of the things that you, you know, because there's no reason, for example, that existing data resources uh, can't actually be put into a commons and really be opened up to, to be accessed in different ways. So an example of that would be, I'm actually talking about this at 3D SIG this afternoon in the context of putting the PDB in there, which of course until several months ago I was a big part of being involved with. Now I'm saying we should be doing something different. We'll see how that goes. But, um, you know, I'm also on the PubMed Central Advisory Board and you could take I mean, right now, if you want to do things across, and Daniel and others will attest to this, if you want to do things across the uh, publicly accessible uh, component of PubMed Central, it's not a totally trivial thing to do. If it was in, if that, if that, if those data objects, as they are, those individual full text of those papers, and APIs to access that information were in a, a common space, you know, maybe it would be a bit different. So that's the basic idea. And, you know, the, the reason for all of this is sort of what I've alluded to already. The federal government, has t or governments in each country, have told us, well, you must share data, so that's the why we're doing this. I mean, we probably think it's a good idea anyway, certainly the people in this room, not other rooms necessarily. But that what they haven't done is they haven't told us how. So, so this is an, you know, an e effort to, to do a how. I have the endorsement of uh, the director of NIH and all of the directors of the institutes and centers to actually pursue this. Uh, they're very interested in it because they want 
more efficient ways of doing things as well. So this various types of data in this, of course, uh, could be a lot of long tail data, which is the stuff that's in your labs right now that sort of degenerates pretty quickly after that paper uh, is uh, published. So suddenly, if you're faced with the need to provide that data, you know, what are you going to do with it? Where are you going to put it? Put it? If it uh, if it actually fits into an existing repository, that's fine. But what about all the other stuff that's really needed to effectively reproduce the work that sort of sits around right now? So maybe the Commons is a sort of place for that. Then there are all the high throughput work that goes on in various facilities. Um, you know, what happens... They, they are at the moment unable to support all this kind of information. Um, certainly to the degree that's required by these new data sharing policies. And then, of course, there's all the nuances associated with clinical and patient data. So this is just, you know, different data types. And then the end game is all the things that you, uh, you, know, you know so well and are so important to all of us, having standards and metrics, use, being usable, and, of course, this discovery. And then there's all the different stakeholders in all of this. And this, this stakeholders in this are not just us and academia, and, and, and it's, it's everybody. I've given uh, talks to uh, high-level representatives of the pharma industry who, in the pre-competitive stage, as in, this is just an example, are interested in putting content into the commons because they see it as... So, uh, you know, this includes, you know, other government agencies, private sector, and other, other, this is not an NIH thing, necessarily. This is, a cent, you know, NSF has expressed a lot of interest in being part of this. And it just so happens that I'm supposed to be the so-called data czar of NIH. Well, it turns out NSF has now hired a data czar who happens to be a good friend of mine from San Diego, who we, we used to have beers before all this, is Chai and Baru. So, uh, you know, we, we've been plotting this for a long time. Um, we're doing a set of things, and I'll tell you more about those because they're quite relevant, but there's, there, there's some infrastructure to support all of this um, around standards, software, uh, data discovery, and other things. I'm going to say a bit more about that. And then, of course, the Commons sort of embraces this through uh, a new set of business models, and I'll give you an example of what that's going to look like. Um, in, and, of course, it's not confined to a cloud environment. There is no physical... Uh, need it's it's whoever complies to these brief rules, right? So it, yes, it will be in public-private clouds. There's no question about that. I mean, believe me, the 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 the, uh, the major uh, cloud providers see opportunities here, right? So they're already on board with this to some degree. Uh, but it could be in an HPC facility. It could be an institution repository. It doesn't matter as long as these it, these objects are identified and they can be indexed. So that's really the extent of it. So if you, what does this sort of thing enable? Well, you can imagine you know, just some simple kinds of uh, uses of it. Of course, the simplest use is a sort of Dropbox. And you know, you know, it, it just has some features that are uh, added onto it that perhaps are not going to be so easily added uh, with, with existing uh, resources like Dropbox or Google Drive. Um, but you know, the idea is you can drag and drop into the commons. When you do that, you can imagine immediately some interesting things happening. So if the file type is identified when it's dragged, uh, it could actually then be authenticated against a standard that you as a community uh, have already uh, established for that file type. At which point it generates a piece of metadata which really describes the, the level of compliance according to that standard for that file that was there. And then that, of course, has its own object, uh, own identifier. The two are linked together, and potentially that, that becomes, if this is a public piece of data, it's added some value to that. And then, you know, you can, uh, another aspect of this is you can then uh, look for commonalities across very disparate data sets in this space that uh, may point commonalities to the by virtue of the provenance to the people who put them there, but you haven't actually revealed anything about the data. So investigator A could be told that, that uh, investigator B has something in common with what they're doing by virtue of a very strong signal in their respective data sets that might be collected for completely different purposes. So why wait until three years or whatever it is down the line when someone publishes 
that information and then suddenly a light goes on that the guy the, or girl in the next building is doing something that I'm interested in. The IF, that could be identified ahead of time. Again, not saying any of this would work, but it opens up these kinds of possibilities, at least in my mind. So it could potentially be a place to discover. So I, keep, I think the, the, the critical, most critical element of all of this in my mind is that there has to be a business model behind it. And you know, I think whether this is a workable business model is being, uh, you know, it needs to be prototyped and established. The way we're currently thinking about it, and uh, George is the one who really uh, has put this together, is we're going to use, and we've got approval already from the higher ups at NIH to do this, uh, there'll be a broker service. So the idea is that when you, you know, just make a couple of scenarios scenario here. When you get a grant, or if you're involved in a grant, you may not get money to um, actually buy your own compute resources. You might get credit to work in the commons. And you can spend that credit wherever you want. So if you happen to be data rich and compute poor in terms of what you do, or vice versa, you would spend it with a provider that makes the most sense for you to use. And you know, because the, this is being aggregated, you know, across the, the amount of money that the NIH spends on this, we can get pretty good deals from providers. And, you know, and of course, anyone can play in this space. All they have to do is agree to be part of the commons. And so it doesn't, you know, institutional repositories could become part of this if they can compete. All right? And so, and then you spend, you spend whatever you get, you use those resources, the broker, the, the broker gets, um, essentially collates what you've spent and then builds the NIH. So it actually prevents what quite often what happens now, which is basically people ask for resources, and this is definitely a, a benefit to you because a, a, you know, if you're not a PI, your PI will actually put in a grant for you know, a computer and some software and some you know, programmer time, and then by the time the money comes, that get, can get spent on something else. And uh, you know, this, uh, this way, you've really, you only get to spend it on, on what you said you were going to spend it on. Um, anyway, that's, that's one possible business model, and we're going to be experimenting with that. All right, so effectively, this is going to be run uh, with a, a few pilots, and I'd be very interested in hearing from folks in the audience about possible pilots. Uh, you know, we'll be sort of assessing the openness of the system. Uh, you know, we, we want to have basic statistical analysis and you know, embedding and, and a whole bunch of other things. Um, we'll then evaluate this. You know, how well does this work? Is it cost effective? Uh, is there uptake? Um, and you know, if, if that goes reasonably well in the next few months, uh, we'll conduct a further set of pilots that really push on it. And then my hope is that by you know, a year from now, uh, well, just, yeah, I guess that is a year from now, you know, I, can, I, I can make a presentation to <laughs> the directorship of NIH and say, we're on our way, uh, it's working. Work? Yes. So about <laughs> Either go to the mic or I'll repeat the question if I can remember it. But, uh, So what you said about the, the funding model for computational resources, that was a really interesting idea. And I just want to maybe add to that. Um, so at a lot of companies, Google included, 3M and others, they give their employees, I don't know, one day a week or some percentage of their time to work on projects that are of interest to them. Sometimes the projects have to be connected to the business, sometimes not. So what I'd like to suggest is, as you're developing this new model for paying for computational resources, can you please build in 20% free time for people like us who are really creative and smart to come up with new ideas and that might not have been in the original grant that got funded. That's my suggestion. This is exactly why I like this idea because First of all, I have no idea, but this is a, I think this is a great idea. Oh, I mean, I, I, could, I could actually imagine somehow, I don't, um, I'm, I'm not very good with bureaucracy, but there must be a way of making this happen within the NIH system. I'm going to tell you about some other things, but I hadn't, I mean, I'm aware of what you've described, and I, I, someone told me at some point Gmail came out from just that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, well, that's, I don't know if that's true, but anyway, 
but it, it's clearly a big win. And my Google bus ex-colleagues, uh, you know, love having that capability uh, to do this sort of stuff. In fact, I'll be trying to get them to work in the lab one day a week, but that doesn't seem to, <laughs> that, that doesn't seem to work very well, I have to say. There's clearly more exciting projects than what we're doing. But yes, okay, so I love it. Yeah, of course. So, so one, thing that's, one thing that's always struck me about the, um, the funding cycle is that the time it takes to apply for and get the grant and the institutional components and the NIH components are, are completely out of step with rapid prototyping. But now you've just outlined something where I wouldn't expect the RFP to come out for nine months. And three months after that, you want to have a report to your yeah. NIH on this. Um, I hear you. Apart from showing up with, with briefcases full of cash, which I would, we'd be a great model at Bosk. Um, what, what, well, it's actually you know, the model that some of the foundations use, but keep going, I'll, I'll tell you what. So, so yeah, so how, how are you going to? So the, the Moore and the, I don't know, perhaps you're familiar with this, but the Moore and Sloan Foundation are actually in the process of funding. I don't know whether it's actually happened yet. They were, they were, they're funding young investigators, and they're basically doing it by saying, okay, write us a brief proposal, two or three pages, and then if that looks compelling, we're going to invite you to give a TED-like talk in front of a review panel. Um, and if the review panel likes what you, you, your pitch, we're going to give you money off the bat. Um, that's, so, that's happening in, at the end of this month. Right. I was asked to review it, but I can't, I just can't have the time. But it's, and I was involved in earlier stages of what Sloan and Moore have been doing around uh, data science, and uh, I'm, you know, these are great, this is a great model. So I actually, when I, I said to Francis Collins, can we do that? Can we do that? And the answer is no, but, but, we, <laughs> but yes. So we can't just show up with cases of money. I mean, there's a whole set of, you know, because, you know, you can imagine that how, you know, if you start just giving money out to people on the street, you know, it, it doesn't go down to it. Um, but we can do prizes, right? So it's all about, I mean, a prize is probably not, I don't know, the question is how big can a prize be? Right? And how many prizes can we give out? But I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm on board with what you're saying. I mean, I think... Um, you know, when I asked Francis Collins what my job description was, he said to change the culture of NIH. Right? And my response was, what am I going to do next week? Right? So, I mean, but we're talking about something that, you know, is, is very ingrained and making change is hard, but there's, there is a recognition of doing things differently and, and prizes and competitions, which, you know, Stephen Friend was here yesterday and he's done so much of that with Dream and with other people. Um, that, you know, these are clearly successful. So I think we, we really need to be looking at some new things. So we're, we're trying those. Um, we'll, we'll figure out how to make it happen somehow. Because this is possibly almost the flip side of, of Anne's question. Do you, are you worried at all that adding more requirements to the scientific process in terms of things people need to do in, to package up and release data, get it into the commons? If one more thing that isn't doing research and is probably less fun than doing research and do you are you worried that that might might translate to even more people writing the google bus uh yes i i think there's there's a tension and there's a balance there so part of it has to do with of course that there's so little value in doing what you described to the data, packaging out, making it reusable, making it useful, right? But, so I think, I'm gonna say a bit about that. So I think we really need, one of the things we need to do, first of all, nothing worries me, okay? I, I mean, I, you know, I, I'm, just, I'm just having so much fun, and I don't, you know, I'll just do the best, anyway, enough of that. Um, so, but yes, I mean, I think there is, a, there is a balance here, but I think one of the things that we have to do is to, the value of software and the value of data has to be, the, the recognition that it's worth more than it is that people value it today has to be there. And we're making some progress for that. So for example, it doesn't sound like a big thing, but the, uh, the NIH uh, recently changed the Bib Sketch format to move away from just purely publications. You know, so it's now, yes, you have your five best publications, but where you think you've made contributions, that can actually be put into the sketch. So 
if you know if you happen to generate a really important reference data set that's used by a lot of people that should be in there what we need and you've worked on this some of you we need we need good data citation principles and they're sort of you know it's kind of almost there we just got to just bite the bullet and say you know this is it and i'm really looking i'm really pushing the nih to say we're going to adopt a data citation format and you can use it as an investigator and it can go in there ditto software okay yeah. Okay, so that addresses the career incentives side of, side of things. But I'm, Closer to okay, okay, so that's addressing the career incentives side of things. But um, there's, there's, there are other reasons people are, people are here. And I, I think you'd argue that one reason people might be here rather than elsewhere is because research is fun. Can you, can, what can you do to make... <laughs> make it more fun. <laughs> make, 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 or, or, or at least, or, or, or I at could least, do a song is, and dance routine, but is, I don't think that would do it. Pardon? Yeah. Is 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 that a consideration when you think about about policy for this kind of thing? Well, yeah. I mean, I don't. I mean, I'm talking about policies and things, but I mean, I think all that, all those, you could say, I'm designing policies for you to have more fun, and. Um, I mean, I, I somehow I feel like if, you know, for example, if you had this one day a week, if we were funding things where you had one day a week to contribute something into anything you wanted into the commons, um, you know, that, that you'd probably have fun, wouldn't you? And I'm sure we'd all benefit from it. So. Okay, so as a variation on the, the Google one day a week thing, um, at the Broad we just went through a process of trying to decide what we wanted to do for the next 10 years and what to do different. And we came up, one of the things that was brought up was something very much like the commons, but more, you know, local. And one of the things that was suggested that got a lot of us really excited was the idea that when you get resources in, in the commons, you know, I'll just use your terms, resources in the commons, you're given, you know, 10 or 20% that you have to give to another project. And this is sort of a way of allowing things that maybe aren't funded to be crowdfunded so that every PI has to give away some percentage of their resources to something that they think is worthwhile. So whether it's a project that already exists that needs more or maybe something that couldn't really easily be funded. Yes, actually, now I've made the connection between the two things. They are somewhat very similar. In fact, Stephen, a friend and I had this discussion last night and I was aware of what that discussion. And I should say, you know, that the commons, you know, this is not my idea. This is, you know, it's been invented, you know, many times. What I would say is that it's not clear to me where it really, you know, it exists. Certainly, you know, and I think, the, the, in, a, in, a, in a way that's perhaps beyond, you know, single institutions or what, I don't know, maybe it does, but, um, you know, I think the idea is to sort of make this the backbone of, of, of what the NIH is doing around the digital enterprise. Okay, and then just one, one other quick question is just a lot of the, one thing that's a big drain on my time and the programs who work with me is keeping things alive that maybe our projects that were done four, five, six, seven, eight years ago are still relevant data, but which have long since run out of funding. So this, I can sort of see the same thing happening here where this is gonna become like, you know, the General Motors pension plan that's dragging on their budget because five years from now, you're paying a lot of money out to the commons to keep things alive. So what is the plan for that? Yeah, well, it's a good question, and you know, you're going to tell me what the plan is. <laughs> As some, you know, but I mean, we have thought about this. So, first of all, you know, this relates. This is not a. There's not a simple answer to this question because there are very a lot of moving parts. So, when you look at, you know, you've got something in the in the commons, whether it be data or software. What we don't do right now is we don't. There's no. There's no. We don't actually look at. What really how that stuff's being used? You know, when I just take what, databases for example, and I've been hitting on this a lot recently, is what the, what's required to maintain and get money to renew a database is basically saying we have you know x number of users in so many countries and there's x petabytes downloaded every year. Well, that doesn't really say how that data is used. And when you look at the, when you start looking at that, and even NCBI doesn't do this very much is you find that the usage patterns of that data are very variable. And they're, you know, there's over, temporally speaking, that, that changes over time as well. So, you know, but we haven't really analyzed what that means and we haven't really looked at it in the context of using it as information to determine what we keep and what we throw away. Right? Or in terms of, say, annotation, where a lot of cost goes, 
you know, effectively all data is created equal. And in a lot of these data resources, everything gets annotated in the same way, but a lot of what's been annotated is not used, and stuff that's, that's probably annotated in a cursory way is used a lot. Does this make sense? No, not to me. So, you know, I think what, how we think about this going forward needs to change. So it may be, okay, your grant to answer the question specifically, the grant runs out, but if there's usage of whatever is there, at least it should be maintained, even when you don't have any chits or whatever it is to support it, right? And you know we'll we'll figure out ways to sort of facilitate that. Melissa. Hi, Phil. Um, so I, you know, I think there's a lot of people in this room that aggregate data over and over and over again from many of these resources that we're talking about, and we never reuse each other's data aggregation strategies. And I think one of the things that we need to think about is how are how does um, coordinate data coordinating centers that get funded now have real issues in the fact that they, they don't actually have the jurisdiction or the authority to enforce you know, meeting those kinds of standards for their, for their um, communities that they're coordinating. They end up like all the sites that are part of some coordinating center co consortium end up still getting to do whatever they want. And then it's coordinating center's um, responsibility to actually make sure the data all works. So there's kind of these two different, and then, and then so, so at the coordinating center level, there's the problem of data integration. And then after that, in the larger community, we still have this larger data integration problem. So how does that work in, in, your, in your mind in terms of these data coordinating centers and these data integration efforts in terms of the commons? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, all, I don't have a good answer, but I would say that uh, it does it does expose it, it has the potential of exposing all of this more than it is now, and uh, you know I think the problem that's more fundamental on that is really how the the groups that maintain the data coordination centers think about it. I mean they you know they need to uh, you know put more restrictions and they they need to do a bit you know and. There's been, there's been, people have been loath to do that. But I have to say, I think, you know, I think the way that, in general, funders are thinking about data is changing. So, and software, for that matter. So, you know, I think this will at least move things somewhat in the right direction. But, I, you know, and you raise a, good, raise a good point. I mean, this is why I'm here, because I, I hadn't actually thought about that explicitly, even though you probably told me before. I just, you know, I'm old, I forget. But I'll remember now. I yeah, so we, we mentioned uh, how people are fly, you know, leaving um, the sciences to go to, to Google. Uh, you know, in, in academic computer science, you have a similar problem, but the, the reason that you have a lot of people who are leaving from the faculty level in academic computer science is that you have much greater capabilities in terms of the software you know, engineering infrastructure to support the development of research artifacts. Um, the big concern that I have here uh, you know, with this commons approach is that for, for a system like this to work with like widely shared code, you, you really rely on the code that is being shared being very high quality. And you know, especially in bioinformatics, there is you know, a, a fair amount of hand, you know, hand wrangling about the fact that a lot of the, the methods that are published are you know, thesis wear. You know, there's something that a graduate student is working on as part of their thesis. Um, they're, they're not a professionally software engineered product. Do you think that NIH will have a shift in their funding that will allow for labs to hire professional software engineers to work, like to work on improving the stability of the software artifacts that they're producing? Yes, and I'm 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 getting a little afraid that if I if I if I I answer yes, there's a, there is an effort at hardening. There's an effort at hardening in NSF as well, um, and this is this was actually one of the requirements that was put to me as part of my job description is to figure out ways of doing that, and that's important. I'm a little worried if I take all these questions that I'm not going to get to. So you two are first with your questions. If I is that all right? Uh, I know I said that. Yeah, but you've been you've done more than I said. So. <laughs> okay. Um, so so what will so because this I think some of this might at least begin and probably raise just more questions. But um, you know some of the things we've been thinking about in this context. Uh, is you know obviously there'll be software identifiers with things that with software that goes in the commons, and we will be funding. And one or two of you were actually in a uh, an NIH funded workshop 
to look at this, uh, there'll be that. Then leads to an R. So there's a report that's going to come out, I think, at the end of this month that everybody's been working on. Uh, that then leads to a request for information, so you get to respond to that. Then there ultimately, you know, it's the, it's the slowness that we heard about before, but it's a process. And I, it's some good things come out of this, and there's really a lot of due diligence done around it. But so there will be uh, the notion of a software discovery index uh, that's that's going to be funded, and. That will the idea is of course that that will make uh, software easy to find, use, and cite, um, and also of course to rate. <laughs> um, so that sort of begins to get at the question you raised. If you know if you know, if there's if there's ratings on this piece of software that says yeah this is this is PhD ware or whatever it is that you know that's you know what to expect. On the other hand. Uh, you know, in all the ways that you do with open source, uh, it could also facilitate, at least in my mind. So to do this, of course, we need a more standard citation scheme for software. Uh, publishers must be encouraged to use and support it. Um, and, you know, uh, metrics of use and ability to provide commentary in the ways we just discussed. So this is sort of, this is already, this, this will be funded and this will be developed. How successful it'll be, we'll see. So there was discussion also at this workshop about what that minimal software specification would be. Uh, and these are obviously things that you would all think about. I won't go through the list, but you get, you know, you get the idea. So you know, the, the idea is this that then represents metadata associated with the, the software object that's in the commons. Uh, and certainly, you know, we've been talk, beginning to talk to various groups that have been thinking about these things for quite a lot of time um, and certainly you know that will continue and if uh, if you're not in that list and you want to talk about this please uh, send me email I'm waiting there sitting there waiting for your email there's none coming in um, so how do we put putting all this together in a coherent strategy uh, I think I'm not maybe I'll just be better to take your questions and go through this but um, let me just say that you know, there, there, are, there are a lot of moving parts here that, uh, that are beyond the commons. Um, but I wanted to emphasize that here because I think that has the most relevance to your uh, community. But very quickly, sustainability, we've talked about some. There's, the, you know, more education programs. There's the standard used way that we do education through NIH and, and, and uh, training grants and so on, but we're looking at some new ways and some of the things you've raised already. I'm um, saying a little more about this big data to knowledge initiative because that's where most of the money is spent. How we look at software and data uh, rich grants within the NIH I think is a problem and everybody's dissatisfied. Yeah, if you don't get funded you're dissatisfied. But of course, but, but even the reviewers sometimes dissatisfied. Even people who get funded are dissatisfied with the process occasionally. If they get the money, they don't usually say much, but you know. Um, I think we could do better with some of this. And we need more dedicated study sections to deal with that. We also need things like, you know, with data sharing particularly, you know, there are requirements for data sharing plans, but they're not enforced. And the, frankly, I know because I used to write them, the plans are a joke. Um, so the idea that we do a better job there, first of all, it's ironic, and this is thanks to Daniel, that the uh, data sharing plan itself is not machine readable. So you know, we're, we're moving to the point where elements of the data sharing plan will be machine readable, so that you know, there can be ex where you say you're going to deposit that data is extracted. And then at the other end, you know, we'll work to, with the data resources, particularly the ones we fund, such that the part of the metadata associated with the data that's in that resource is the grant number. So you've closed the circle. So you can automatically check whether, in fact, you know, users, uh, investigators are compliant. Uh, so that's just an example. Lots of other areas of collaboration. So the, common, the commons users, um, to get this thing off the ground, we're about to award, so this year we're spending like 40 million bucks on this. Next year and, and several years into this, I'm gonna, we're, I, we're going to be spending a hundred million dollars a year to, uh, to make some of this stuff uh, happen. So uh, we're about to award a series of centers of excellence in data science. A data discovery uh, index consortium uh, is about to be funded where the, the, you know, how, again, this applies to data in the same way I just described for software, 
and training grants. There will be significant number of software development awards for data science activities uh, early, probably some of them actually fairly early in 15, so something to look out for. Uh, also a standards framework um, and then the software index consortium will happen in 15. So there's these, all of these efforts will be coordinated to try and, um, assuming it looks like it's working, to drive uh, this whole concept of the commons. And so there'll be, uh, well, I won't go into the details of that. All right. So the, in, in closing, uh, you know, the idea here is to foster the development of an ecosystem, in, which I think, which is really this framework that, to me, for some time I felt has been missing in what we do as we are so, as, as biomedical research becomes more and more digital. And so this is really a way to try and stimulate that happening. And you know, we'll assess how well it's working and we'll make corrections as we go along. So the first part of this, to foster that ecosystem uh, as, as part of a digital enterprise, that's my words, the enhances health, length, life and reduces illness and disability is actually the mission of the NIH. So it's just, you know, I've stolen words. Uh, there's a lot of people who've been involved in this so far. In the three months I've been at NIH, it's been, it's been an enormous amount of fun. I've met some really smart and dedicated people. I've named a few of them here. Uh, we, had a, we had a retreat not that long ago of, of people who were involved in the, all of this internally. And it was a lot of fun. We even had balloons. Um, okay, so with that, I will stop and I will take those, t if those two questions are still pertinent, they will be first and anything else we have time for in, in the hands of our illustrious chairs. Thanks, really a great talk. Um, Harry Hockheiser, by the way, University of Pittsburgh. Um, I want to follow up on what Melissa said a little bit regarding the question of of who's doing the data and how does it get annotated? She always curated. asked me the hard questions. Well, man. okay, I'm, I'm, I, I, I didn't like your answer, so I'm <laughs> going to go be a little bit harder with it. So let me tell you a little story where I was involved with the Data Coordinating Center. We struggled with some of the data. We came up for a second round of funding and we said, we're going to work in a lot of detail here to have really strong criteria for what the data should be. We're going to make requirements, we're going to have plans, we're going to have contracts with the providers, et cetera. We got these reviews that said, you're asking too much. Why not just put the data out there and let the community annotate it? So I'm going to argue now that you've got really a massive problem of mind shift that is implicit in all of this, of changing the way people look at collecting and managing data. All of those people in the world who are not informaticians are not thinking this way right now. They're thinking, Hey, I've got my lab notebook and my three ring binder and my Excel spreadsheets. I'm good to go. And the program, no, I'm serious. And the program no, officers, right the program officers and the reviewers are not necessarily all the way on your train. Although I am. I mean, I'm, I'm in agreement, but I don't think a lot of the rest of the community is. How do we get there? Well, I mean, first of all, I mean, I, you know, I, just, just this group of people here who are part of that enterprise that you just described, who are actually responsible for the big data to knowledge initiative, don't ne didn't really necessarily get it themselves. That was what the retreat was all about. And it doesn't happen in one you know, balloon blowing day of fun and, and games. It, 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 it is a process. This is, you know, this is gonna take a long time. I mean, you know, this is, but, I, ha I have to believe that it, there, is, there is the possibility to make inroads into this. I mean, I thought about, you think I wanted to leave tenure in the sun in San Diego to go in, into the humidity and, of, of Bethesda without good reason? I mean, I, I sort of feel like there, that there is this opportunity, even f with all the impediments that you, you've just described. And part of it has, and I, in the, the time I've been there, I haven't been disillusioned in any way because that the, 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 the folks involved in those data consortiums and, and just the, the cost and the, the, all, the, all the things that bother the, IC, the directors of institutes and centers at NIH all see that this is not working very well. So they, you know, I think they're at least willing to experiment with some new things. You know, and we'll see. I, I, you know, I, I, I think it's healthy to be very skeptical about, you know, what can be achieved in what time. 
But I think if there's, my hope is that if there's a few wins, a few obvious gains in this, that, uh, you know, and we could speculate on what some of those might be. And, you know, I'll, I'll just give you, uh, you know, sort of example, is the idea that right now, if you, first of all, I think the way we manage data um, is, 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 is not the kind of model we need for the future. We've set this thing up as a set of silos based on what made sense probably when people focus very much on one particular type of data, which was years ago. In a translational world, we're, we're into all different data resources all the time. And it's actually become cumbersome to, to be actually able to do that. And it's not clear to me that the way that the data is necessarily presented for those what people really want to do is best looked after by just one group. The idea that some of this is more open. So if you took some of this, and the fact is it's going to happen anyway because, you know, the, the, if some of this will not be funded going forward. You know, so this data which has been carefully looked at will be somewhere, let's say it's in the commons. And then, you know, others will have the opportunity and one day a week that you're being funded to work on this, maybe you could do something really interesting with a subset of that data that has value to others. We can measure that value, and then in some way you're rewarded for it. I'm making all this up. He's not satisfied, but we can talk more. <laughs> cool. So I wanted to follow up on the software development question, um, comment that was made. Um, well, one thing I remember from when I was in grad school, I worked on a couple cyber, cyber infrastructure projects that were trying to attack very similar problems like this and you know, have the community, have the researchers build a lot of tools that would be shared. And on those projects, the, the, the biggest change I made on those projects when I was involved with them is we actually hired professional software engineers to work on them. And it was hard to talk the researchers into doing that. But as soon as it happened, we were able to really shift the quality and also the productivity of the teams. The researchers could focus on research, the developers could focus on development. People tended to be a little more happy. Part of it too was we had to, we did talk about that respect problem and the mutual respect between the two groups. Um, that was a hard one to broach with some researchers, but, but it was a good one. So I just want to you know, kind of reiterate the value of having good software engineers. And also um, in the way that you've described this model, there's, you, you actually have kind of the framework for that already. I think you know, if you use the credit system to kind of give a handout to Amazon, you know, why not use the same thing and do that you know, give credits for software development so people can kind of, you know, work with engineering firms to outsource some of the software development. So it's a possible way to have that funding when, uh, available and, you know, give a mechanism for it. So. No, I mean, I'm certainly supportive of hardening of software and the value of software engineers. I mean, I, you know, I, in the PDB, which I was involved in running for years, I mean, we, we really use people who are with, with software engineers. And I'd say the key to the success there, which I think sometimes it's been successful and other times not, particularly in the cyber infrastructure space, is you've got to have a really good interface between the people who understand what they really want to get out of that software and the people who are hardening it. Because otherwise, if you don't have that interface, it tends to, you know, I've consulted with endless groups where that's not happened, you know, and it's a disaster. So it has to be carefully managed, but yeah. Yes. And that's one thing with um, the credit model where you could actually come up with firms that you know are good to work with, or even just contractors out there who, who know how to work in that. Because there are people who do scientific software well, and there are people who do a very bad job at it. And if you've never hired someone before to do that, it is hard to vet it. So having an agency that can act as a broker to say, mm -hmm. these are good ones, these are bad ones, is a potential opportunity. That's an interesting everyone. idea. So. Thank you. Thanks, Nomi. Um, quick introduction. John Green, Senior Director of Bioinformatics. Thanks for the contractor plug, because I am a Beltway bandit. Um, you will see me around the campus, that I guarantee you. I'm also adjunct faculty in bioinformatics at Johns Hopkins, so I wear academic hat. We've gotten rumblings that um, at NCI, they are seem to be against um, public clouds. Um, the recent award of the NCI Genome Data Commons, which has not been publicized very much, but was won by the University of Chicago, um, plans to use a private cloud. There were other proposals that used public clouds, and we were getting some rumblings that there was very much a, a backlash. They didn't want to use the public clouds. So I was curious to hear your input about that, and then I have a very quick comment, and then I'll shut up, Nomi. Um, well, first of all, you know, every, every of the 27 institutes and centers march to their own drum. My job is trans-NIH, so all I do is sit there and talk to Harold Varmus, and then I go and talk to, you know, it's, um, and I know Harold well because of um, various reasons, plus particularly one of them. But, um, yeah, I mean, there's that, 
perhaps is quite true. But at the same time, you know, there are many other parts of the NIH that are moving forward. You know, dbGaP is, will probably end up in a public cloud environment. Excellent. Okay. So I, I, uh, I can't say that uncategorically, but that would be my suspicion. And I can guarantee that there will be other resources that end up in public cloud environments. So, uh, you know, it, it, we're, we're actually in the early days of experimentation with all of this. And mm -hmm. that's another reason why this appeals to me, because, you know, it pushes us in, in different directions. And, you know, some of it's going to work and some of it's not going to work. A very quick comment, the DCC, I was PI on the TCGA DCCC for about a year and a half, and our contract said, final arbiter of data standards, ha. Um, everybody had their, their say. We couldn't get the centers to agree. The program office overrode us. Um, it was extremely hard to get any kind of consistency to that data, and we took a heck of a beating over it. <laughs> so it is a real problem out there. I'll echo the comments of my colleagues in the room. And thanks, Phil, for giving us hope, too. <laughs> okay. Well.